Very good. Okay, well, welcome everybody to the Amherst Design Review Board meeting of uh, September 23rd, 2024. My name is Erica Zikas and I'm the chair of the DRB, um, calling this meeting to order at 5.01 p.m. The meeting is being recorded and will be made available via the Town of Amherst YouTube channel. Minutes are being taken. Pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021 and extended again by Chapter 2 of the Acts of 2023, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone. No in-person attendance of the members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. A hyperlink to the hearing will be posted on the town's online calendar. Board members, I will take roll call when I call your name. Let me know you're here. Uh, Lindsay Schnarr. Didn't hear you. I know you're here. <laughs> I'm just wondering if we have an audio. Um, while you fix that, uh, Karen Winter. Here. Pat Off. Present. Karen Blum. Here. And Eric Zikos present. Board members, if technical issues arise, we may need to pause temporarily to fix the problem and then continue the meeting. If the discussion needs to pause, it will be noted in the minutes. Please use the raised hand function to ask a question or make a comment. I will see your request and call on you to speak. And after speaking, please remember to remute yourself. The general public comment item is reserved for public comment. Um, regarding items that are not on tonight's agenda. Please be aware the board will not respond to comments during the general public comment period. Public comment could also be heard at other times during the meeting when determined appropriate. Please indicate that you wish to make a comment by clicking the raised hand button when public comment is solicited. If you've joined the Zoom meeting using a telephone, please indicate that you wish to make a comment by pressing star nine on your phone. When called on, please identify yourself by stating your full name and address and put yourself back into mute when finished speaking. Residents can express their views for up to three minutes or at the discretion of the Design Review Board Chair. If a speaker does not comply with these guidelines or exceeds their allotted time, their participation can be discontinued from the meeting. So tonight's agenda includes the following. Uh, we'll open with general public comment uh, and then head into applications. And tonight we have uh, one, Pulling up the agenda, bear with me too. Sorry, DRB uh, FY202502 North Prospect Street uh, parking behind a parking lot behind CVS for an electric vehicle charging station. Um, and do we have just into anything for DRB202503 new retail store? No, they did no. not complete their application in time. Okay. So we'll see them next time. And then we'll do uh, approval of the last meeting minutes from August 19th. Um, and then other business is to continue the discussion of design review board standards. And then we'll adjourn. Lindsay's here. <laughs> you want to try your audio, Lindsay? Not sure why. Um, okay, so uh, is we we just heard her. Oh, did we? Oh no, that was you. Yeah. Okay. Can you hear me now? We can. Yeah. Well, that's weird. Nice. I just did a microphone test, and can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Whatever it was, it's gone. <laughs> okay. Gremlins out. Um, okay, so are there any members of the public who wish to make public comment? We have zero members in attendance. All right. Crowd goes wild. Let's um, then head into talking about EV charging stations. Hi, Stephanie. Erica, how are you? I'm fine, thanks. Welcome. Thank you so much. Nice to see you all. Thanks. Um, Stephanie, sometimes I offer to share my screen and show all the documents. I'm guessing that you have that capacity and you're welcome to do that, but let me know if I can be helpful. 
I do have that capacity and I do have things keyed up so or queued Great. up so I'm happy to share my screen and walk you through. So um, just a really quick overview. We have charging stations throughout the town of Amherst. There are currently seven locations. All of the stations that we currently have are level two charging, which is um, typically takes between two to four hours for a vehicle, an electric vehicle to sort of top off or um, completely um, fill the battery charge, complete the battery charge. So those are take much longer. Um, what we're proposing for the CVS lot, or what's affectionately known as the CVS lot, which is actually technically the North Pleasant Street lot that's adjacent to North Prospect Street. <laughs> Sorry, it is confusing. But um, that, that location, we're proposing two level three charging stations, which are known as fast charge stations. And I can tell you as an electric vehicle owner that those stations are at a premium. They bring people who are driving with electric vehicles into your community because you are always looking for fast charging stations. Um, they charge much quicker. Um, it depends on the station and the, the level of um, capacity, but Typically, it can take anywhere from 45 minutes to maybe an hour and a half. And that's like at the at an hour and a half is kind of a long period of time. Typically, it's faster. Um, so people do tend to look for these stations. And the nice thing about this location, especially, and I can say if I was someone who was commuting, this would definitely be a place I would go to because it's very close to the downtown and there's things to do while you're charging. So even though it's a fast charge, it can still take a little bit of time and it really does increase um, uh, people attending, you know, people uh, checking out your, your downtown area, having you know, shopping, going to restaurants, that kind of thing. So with that, I will share my screen. So just give me one moment. And I just wanted to start just basically with the um, with the location of the station. So this is the CVS lot, which, uh, well, actually, technically, this is the CVS parking is over here. Um, but this is the public portion of the North Pleasant Street lot. Um, and again, it's really adjacent to North Prospect Street, but um, but this location is a public lot. And where we're proposing to put the, the level three stations are kind of at the end here. The configuration is a little bit different than this. Um, uh, things changed. We were working with our, um, our Voltrek who is designing the station uh, location and installation, but we had some requirements from the um, building commissioner uh, that they had to adhere to. So it's kind of changed the layout just a little bit, but I'll show you the layout that's been revised, which you should have in your packets as well. So just wanted to orient you. I will say about this location, there is a guardrail, an existing guardrail right here, and that will stay. Um, this lot um, I don't know how old this particular photo is, but this lot, this area is very degraded. The pavement is broken up. It's in really rough shape. So the nice thing about this is that that section where the EV pads will go um, is going to get leveled. Um, not a lot of leveling is required, but there will be some leveling and repaving of where the station will be. So um, I will go from that to, just give me one moment. This is the layout. Can has it switched? I can't tell if it switched. So just making sure what you're seeing. Yes, um, so yep. great, excellent. So this is the layout of the um, of the proposed spaces. So um, it's a little different in that um, these um, these areas are just a little bit smaller than the current existing spaces. So um, it's a bit little bit less. One of the stations is required for to be ADA accessible. And so we had to ensure that that space was wider um, to accommodate uh, potentially a van, uh, an electric van, which they exist. So um, had to accommodate that. So um, so this in this instance, the the vehicle would this is the actual charging pad. So this is where the charger would be. 
um, this is where the charger would be for this. So they're both, um, they're not in the actual parking space, they're adjacent to it. So the cords are typically long enough where a vehicle can pull in and just plug in. They're, the cords um, actually cover quite a bit of distance. So um, they could easily pull in and, and connect to this charger. Um, so this would also require bollards be installed. So there will be bollards, these yellow dots around the the chargers themselves are yellow bollards. And I do have a picture that I will show you as well. This is just the layout. Um, and then this pad here is where the um, electrical equipment will go. So the utility equipment will go here. And again, I have a picture that I'll show you of what a typical um, design looks like. And these are also, again, all of these are bollards for protection of the electrical equipment. So if you just give me another moment, I will go to, I'm gonna stop sharing this screen for a moment. Um, and let me just get up some photos for you to see what they look like. So I'll start with the charging station. Okay, so this is an image of what the charging station looks like. And again, this is level three. You'll notice on this one that there are two charging ports. There's actually only going to be one because this station actually is both level two and level three. What we're getting looks the same. Uh, it's not different. It still looks the same as this particular station, but it has one port, which is just the level three access. And let's see if I can easily go to the next photo. Oh, okay. Um, this image is just a different angle. Um, now, you'll notice again that this is not in the actual parking space. So the, the charging unit is actually adjacent to it and where the hashed space is. And then to look at what that looks like, this is an example of what our two stations will look like. So the two stations will look like this. What's next to them over here are level two stations. So this is what a level three charger looks like. Um, there will be uh, striping in front of it as indicated here. And there also will be this little uh, logo to indicate that it's for electric charging only. And there is signage as well that says that it's level, uh, the electric vehicle charging parking only. And I'm going to also then show you a picture of what the bollards look like. So this, um, this isn't unfortunately not the neatest photo, but this is what the typical utility equipment looks like. So in the space adjacent, adjacent to um, the outer, um, the outer parking, charging, uh, parking and charging spot, um, this is the equipment pad where it's indicated for the equipment pad. This will look like this, and it's also surrounded by the bollards. So it's very basic, and of course, this will be paved. It won't, you know, it'll look a lot nicer when completed. Um, and I can go back to the map if that would help you to show you the layout again, or is there an image you want to see again? The layout? I'm yeah, looking at your the, heads the, nodding. So the, the layout would be helpful. Yeah. Okay, sure. And are our okay. bollards going to be yellow painted? <laughs> Concrete they, like these are? Yes. So that's what they're proposing, but they can be something different. Um, I think I, that's where I wish I'm sorry that Jody couldn't make the meeting, but um, they can be, you know, I think they have silver bollards as well. Um, so they can be silver, but, you know, the nice thing certainly about the yellow is that they're noticeable, but they can make them silver as well. And I, unfortunately, I don't have an image of those, um, the bollards of the other ones, but right now they're proposing yellow, but they can be silver. And here's the layout again. So again, this, what I just showed you that image of the equipment utility connector, that's that's this equipment pad right here. That's where that will go. Yeah. And the bollards won't be around it in the same way the bollards will be located here. And I can also go back to the photograph if you want to get a better sense of the layout again, like where now that you see the layout, 
I can go back to the photograph of the location. Sure. Okay, so let me see. I don't know that I can make this bigger. Sorry. Let's see. There. Um, so again, this is where the utility equipment will be. And this is the location of the of the units and the parking. So if you're ready for for questions, I see that um, Karen has her, her hand up and I will invite questions from the board, but I am just curious if you could say a little bit about why that back corner, I'm thinking if there's an accessible uh, spot, why we aren't looking at a, a place that's closer to the business entrances, say the opposite corner? Mm -hmm. Does it have to do with electrical services or? Exactly. <laughs> That's the mm -hmm. answer. It's just that there's an, a utility pole here and the connection, this is where the connection is. This is the closest connection to the utility. So um, that's that's why. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, Karen, go ahead. I'm wondering why um, the, the charging stations that I'm familiar with usually service two cars at a time. It's one station and then there are two nozzles. Uh, is there a reason? I mean, you're all this and there are only going to be two cars that are going to be able to charge. I can imagine that this will be in high demand. Um, thanks. That's a great question, Karen. Um, so the reason why is because they're level three, you could have... Um, a dual unit, but what happens is um, because they're fast charge, if you have two vehicles plugged in at the same time, it it decreases the speed at which they charge the battery. So it serves it it it's much more effective to just have a one port versus two, because it'll be the same amount of energy that's being the same amount of capacity, energy capacity, electricity capacity that's being offered by that one unit, but it would actually be then divided between two vehicles versus the one. So you kind of lose the benefit of having it be a fast charge station. And and as I noted, we do have multiple units, um, level two units here in town. Um, as someone who's driven around, I'm, I'm often surprised when I go even further east to some communities where I would anticipate that they would have multiple stations. We're actually doing pretty well. <laughs> so I feel pretty good about the fact that we have seven, you know, um, level two stations in town, which is, a, a, as you mentioned, have two ports. So there's effectively 14 op opportunities for level two charging. But, you know, because we do have that, if people are staying in town longer, they're not necessarily gonna look for the level three so much. So they will be in demand, but I don't think, um, you know, the fact that we have so much other charging infrastructure in town uh, that's all located very conveniently downtown, um, you know, if someone isn't in a hurry, they they can use those other opportunities to charge. And so, um, you know, it would be nice to have four ports and we try, we actually did try to get four ports. But again, for the reasons that I mentioned, it wasn't really, uh, we'd have to put four stations in really to get the same kind of benefit. Mm -hmm. Thank there's you. The, there's this fast chargers at the Stop and Shop in Hadley, and I know that UMass has been working on getting fast chargers back at the visitor center. So there's a there's a small constellation of places for those of us with EVs to to plug in. Um, Pat, I see your hand, and then we'll go to Lindsay. Sure. I wonder if we could go back to the photo of the charging station. Sure. Uh, in front of the building um, for two reasons. One, it, will the charging stations in the CVS lot be this orange front? Yes, because that's the, the uh, these are charge point. Okay. Level three chargers, so yes. <clears throat> and these are silver bollards. Are yes. they metal or, or are they concrete? They're metal, actually. So these are, this is an example. I'm sorry, I didn't realize that before. But yes, these are the silver. They could install a silver if you preferred that over the yellow bollards. It, it seems more pleasing to the eye than 
and having the yellow unless there's a, a safety factor in having the yellow. They were a little bit taller. The yellow bollards are a bit taller. And I think the our um, town electrical inspector, Tina Shen, uh, preferred the yellow bollards because they are taller and more visible. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thanks. Lindsay, go ahead. Um, I just have two questions. Um, one is lighting, since it is in the back corner. Um, is that something that you've looked at? Um, it's I, I don't know if they propose lighting as part of this. I mean, that might be something the town would um, investigate. I think there is a light pole right near there. I'd have to double check, to be honest. Um, it's, if you, I, when Lindsay brought it up, I was looking, I happen to have the site plan open on my other screen. If you if you okay. go to the aerial photograph, we can see the shadow. Oh, right. You can see the shadow of at least one light pole. It's not immediately okay. adjacent. It's kind of in the middle of that row. Oh, right, right here. Yes, I see where you're referring to right here. Yeah. Is that, and yep. I don't know if there's also one in the back corner because it seems like the shadows I, lining up perfectly. I seem to recall, I know that there's a pole here. So I seem to recall that there is lighting, um, but I certainly think it's something that we could ensure that there's light. I mean, typically stations do have lighting, especially if they're going to be operating at night, but I can, I, that's something I could sort of ask about, but um, I just don't have an, a direct answer right now. Mm -hmm. okay. My other question is if you will be um, locating signage to indicate that this station is here on North Prospect and perhaps even on um, North Pleasant. Yeah, I mean, I think we would, um, I, I know that as, so I should mention that this was grant funded through the Mass EVIP program. So that's the electric vehicle incentive program. So they require signage to direct people to the charging. So there will be, there should be some signage that will just have an arrow, you know, like a. I think the signs that I've seen more recently were pretty, you know, just kind of, you know, um, discreet green signs that said EV charging with an arrow. And is... Go ahead. I was just wondering in terms of the signage, is that sort of a universal signage? Is that a marker throughout the country that people will recognize? The vehicle with a plug? Yeah, I mean, that's the, the... that indicates that in this lot, we provide that service. Yes, it, yes, if yes. If you, the, you know, I, I can say that as an EV user, when you, you know, I mean, typically you're using your app, I have to say, um, very rarely do I look for the signage that directs me to a charging location. I'm using the app and the map that I have on my phone or on my display on my car. So, um, but the signage is pretty universal and the signage is what the state has provided for us to choose from, you know, which we want to, um, which we want to use, but basically they're I think I know that Guilford Mooring likes everything to be consistent and the planning board likes to keep everything consistent. So we would use whatever directional information that we typically use now to locate those charging stations. Thank you. Yeah, and actually that was my question was the um, the painted pavement, the little green car with the, the plug. I'm wondering if on all of the town owned properties with EV, if that's going to become a consistent language. I know you can't make that happen on private properties, but at least if we're starting to develop a consistent uh, strategy for signing uh, EV stations, I think that that would be important. So like behind town hall, do those are the green cars painted on the pavement? No, not currently, no. Yeah. Because that was done a while, those were done years mm -hmm. ago, um, and we weren't required to do that. It It is a nice visual, I will say. Yeah. Um, it's, it makes it much more easy to locate where you need to go. I know sometimes I'm 
if I'm just personally using an app and I pull into a parking lot, sometimes it says it's kind of somewhere, but you don't always see the station right away. And that just makes it really easy to find Yeah, I agree. where you need to Agree. go. Yeah. So I know that that, you know, other town owned properties with EV stations aren't part of our purview tonight, but I would advocate for that. Just again, just kind of come up with a consistent language. Um, could the yellow bollards be orange to match the orange of the charging station? Is it just paint or is it a wrap? Like what's the... You know, that's a really good question. I really wish Jody was here to answer that because I don't know the answer. Um, I, I've never I seen them in the orange. safety concern, but yeah. I do too. I just, they never, orange never came up as an option. <laughs> it was, you know, they're typically, and I've seen them, they're typically yellow. Yeah. Um, or they can be also just kind of a concrete um, post. Yeah. Um, so those are the only two that I recall them even offering was just the silver or the yeah. the yellow i mean people are generally moving pretty slowly when they're pulling into a parking place i'm i would for aesthetic reasons think that the the yellow bollard with the orange station and the green paint that's a lot um and i would like to see the the silver but i also understand the the safety implications and I want to make sure that we're doing the right thing. So it's kind of hard to judge that one. Um, and turning radius for a van to get into that little corner spot, we studied this. Yes, yeah, so that's why, let me go to the layout again. So that's, yes, so there's, that's part of the the design of making this you know wider and also we'll leave enough room with this space as kind of a loading and loading it leaves plenty of space for a van to pull out okay. um, and there's plenty of room between um, the other row of parking okay uh okay so Questions have been answered. Let's move on to uh, a discussion about whether we have recommendations or not so we can put together a proposal to vote on this. I've heard folks asking about uh, lighting and I feel like that that's something that we could insist on. We've asked questions about the color of the bollards The location seems like a fixed, it's not, a, from my perspective, the location is not ideal, but it does seem like it's kind of being led by access to enough electricity. Um, so are there other, are th let's try to speak to recommendations, Karen, Karen, sorry. Um, so I'm sorry, I should have asked this question too. Is there signage, like, is there a time limit? Does, what's to prevent somebody from leaving their car there uh, in a much needed space uh, where mm. other people want to go and, you know, having an extended dinner and then nobody can come. Is, is there signage? How do you limit this? How do you keep this uh, going? Well, this is fast charging, so it, it does actually um, require less time. But for our other EV charging spaces, there's a four hour limit. And when people um, do pay by pay by plate, you know, when people are having to use our town's system for parking. Um, it identifies, you know, these locations. So if someone is there longer, um, it would just, the, the parking enforcement would deal with it the way they deal with all our other, um, our other uh, EV charging, parking locations. So there's already, the town already charges for these spaces. There's already a limit into how long you can be there. Um, and there's already enforcement about that. So um, these would be marked. I don't know if they are going to alter the the amount of time, if it would be two hours um, versus the four hours. I guess that, that piece hasn't really been determined yet. But I think that signage would be, it's either going to say a four hour limit or maybe a two hour limit. 
Thank you. Thoughts on yellow versus silver versus concrete bollards. I think I'd like to see the silver ones. Lindsay? I second this silver. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree. I think the silver is more aesthetically pleasing. I don't know what the difference in the height between that and the concrete ones are, but I would think that if they're intended to be strong, that they would serve the same purpose. Yeah. I th I agree with uh, silver and also if the lighting is adequate, mm -hmm. then that might also help in identifying and securing the area. Yeah. Well, I'm going to propose some verbiage here. Um, we approve the proposal with the following recommendations that the town choose the option for silver bollards and that the town must study the lighting at night and install adequate lighting for safety if necessary. Anybody wants to pick that up as a motion? I, I would make the motion according to your wording, Erica. I agree. Second. Second. Thank you. We've got Karen Blum as the second. Um, all right. The, all those in favor, please raise your hand. Say aye. 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 That's unanimous. Stephanie, can you work with that? Yes, thank you so much. I That's greatly great. appreciate all your time. I have to say, as an EV driver myself, I have all the fast chargers on <laughs> the, whole, <laughs> the whole route to anywhere, like memorized. Um, and yeah, you do. You get out of your car, you go get a coffee, take a walk. Um, it's it's really great to have that right in town. Yeah, this is a really nice location. I'm, I, you know, I, I'm here, you know, most days of the week. So um, it's just nice to know that it's here for other people. Thank you. Well, thank you all so much. Greatly appreciate it. Have a good night. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. You too. Close up some documents. Jacinta, I closed the agenda. What's next? Are we going straight to? No, we're doing minutes. We're minutes. Doing minutes next. Minutes. Okay. All right. Okay. So this is the meeting of August nineteen. We didn't review any applications and there was no public comment. We approved the previous meeting minutes and then we had a modestly productive conversation, initial conversation about the standards review. So if you would just take a look here and then we can have somebody could make a motion to approve or amend the minutes. I make a motion to approve the minutes of August 19th. August 19th, yeah. Is there a second? I second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All right. And Lindsay's abstained, I think. Um, okay, great. So. DRB standards. Um, thank you all for sending in your comments, either to me directly or to Jacinta. I, I've gathered up from Karen, Karen, and Pat. Um, and 
I would say that the the consistent theme, although everybody took a different approach, was to simplify. And uh, some comments were about kind of readability and formatting of the document. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> and so, some comments were um, about kind of reorganizing the information. Uh, so I took those as my, as was my charge from you all with I took your your approaches to reinvention of these or uh, recreation of these these um, design review standards and then I also looked at the original and what Rob had done uh, Rob Wachilla had done as an initial proposal to us um, long long ago uh, after a, a very early conversation that the board had. Um, and I tried to wrestle with them a little bit. And so if you'll bear with me, um, I will share a document where I kind of pulled your comments together and then have a, a proposal at the end for us to take a look at. Does that sound good? Great. Any comments before I jump into that? It's a lot of work. Thank you. Yeah. It was Thank you. Wonky and fun. All right. So um, you can see that there's a, it's it's small right now. I will blow this up in a second, but just to give you a sense of like how much text is involved here. Um, I have each uh, person's sort of submittal um, and you can see that there's a the name in, in yellow highlight. Um, and there's pads and then the proposal is uh, here on the, the last bit. Um, and then for, tell me if you can see the screen switch to PDF, the, the uh, kind of the, uh, the existing design review board standards. Can you see that screen? Yeah. Yes. Okay, great. So this is what we're, what we refer to today. Um, and then this is the, the, the red line document and the, the kind of cleaned up version of what uh, had been proposed to us by Rob um, so long ago. So if I go back to here, um, I will now enlarge this and we can see what Karen suggested. Karen, if you want to speak to this. Well, it was just taking, it seemed as if in each category, things were, um, could be distinguished and weren't, and it was confusing. So I just broke out building versus surroundings. Yeah, building versus surroundings. For each category. Mm -hmm. And keeping the, the height, proportion, scale, et cetera, et cetera. And I, I referred to other documents that were out there. Yeah, yeah. Um, I included mechanical equipment as something to consider. Yeah, I really appreciated that. But that was the only um, substantive change which, as to content content yeah it was more yeah. organization yeah i mean there were little things added here and there but mm -hmm. otherwise it was mainly organizational sure um and then <laughs> karen went for the super simple <laughs> you want to say a few words for us and see your your approach to this um yeah i just kind of took the wording of the more complicated wordy thing. And I just thought they're saying the same thing about all these things that they really have to uh, be compatible with the style and character of the structure and the site being altered. And these were the things that consider. And so I thought, let's just really simplify. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then Pat, you kind of acknowledge that you're kind of entering into this conversation fresh and yeah, I think my 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 um comment was was the reorgan was just defining the the sections yeah. much as Karen Karen did, um, but I like the the mechanicals that you added, Karen, because having had dis discussion around the library and what was on the roof, um, that is that really is an important thing to consider. Absolutely, yeah. All right, so with all of that and also including Rob's, which was more of a 
if I switch real quick, you know, he he did this thing for us where he, instead of doing it paragraph style, created a list for each of the proportions of fenestration, proportions of signage, right? It's very um, kind of checkbox version. I, I didn't go with the list, but did pull those things out um, and took um, Karen's, I agreed with Karen's approach of kind of separating out the the building and its massing as it relates to its site, and then the building as it relates to its own internal components. Um, but it it turned out a little bit uh, different. Um, kind of overall building height proportions and scale. Kind of lumped those things together because so often they are reliant upon one another to make any sense. Um, but this is, you know, the building as it relates to its neighbors, right? Its site, its surroundings. And then this is still about the building and its surroundings, relation of structures and open spaces. Ground level design elements, right? The building at the pedestrian scale is its own line. Then we have landscape and streetscape elements. And then I didn't know the right language for this, but I said constituent elements. Now we're looking at the building itself, the, the, the windows of the building vis-a-vis -vis the wall space, the windows relative to doors and columns and so on and so forth. And I put directional expression in there because again, this is about how constituent parts of a building relate to one another in the context of a facade um, or elevation. And then architectural features and details, mechanical equipment stays in and then signage as a final category. I know this is a, a lot to read through tonight and we could I could just kind of go do the slow scroll to give you time. Um, I might also propose that I circulate this to the board. And when at the next meeting, we come back with some real, like real critique and try to try to take this conversation to the next level where it would be nice in my mind to do some real work on these and have a proposal maybe in two or three meetings from now that we can share with the town planners and Dodson and Flinker who are now have moved on to um, looking at downtown design standards as part of their charge. Um, and it would be nice for us to share with them what we're thinking rather than wait for them to tell us what we should think. I I have to say, I like this format, Erica. It's what I was um, suggesting in terms of, of separating the sections with, with bold um, for the important characteristics, but it's in context. I didn't, I didn't like the checkbox approach. Mm -hmm. It's just same, not in context to me. So I appreciate that you maintain this format and and um, improved it. Well, thank you. I would I want to just also acknowledge that um, Karen did the same thing, and I I was like I saw the checkbox and I thought oh that seems so efficient, and then I was like you know what I don't I, I don't think that's what we what we need. We we are thinking about everything relative to everything else, and context is important here. So. Really I appreciate I, that. Karen? I really appreciated what you did. I had a, a question. I debated this for a while. Shell versus should. Because mm. shell carries more weight in terms of this is a requirement versus should, which leaves a little, sounds a little more open to uh, uh, interpretation. It's a very good point. I just, I just debated that for a while. Mm -hmm. We are, of course, an, uh, an advisory committee, uh, but it's nice to 
put some weight behind our time and 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 effort and and consideration of these projects. Um, so yeah, it, it's an interesting comment. Lindsay, did I see you want to jump in? Yeah. Um, first of all, thank you, and I apologize for not contributing to um, the notes, and I would be happy to put some effort toward it um, if we end up distributing it tonight and coming back to it next time. Um, I think overall it feels a lot more efficient um, and clear. Um, my, <laughs> this is like out of the box question, but um, mm -hmm. I feel like one thing we often get hung up on, especially with larger scale projects like library or um, the one on Boltwood, um, is the idea of like, how do we define compatibility? And I'm curious to hear other people's thoughts on how we address that term. I mean, coming back to, you know, language, um, it's referenced and it is kind of like the word that is <laughs> the pin of all of these pieces. Um, and I think it's just such a subjective word and I don't think it's the wrong word, but I think maybe there could be a discussion of what it means to be compatible. And because I think some people's impression is that compatible means that it, you know, it kind of is seamlessly fits in. And then when a building doesn't, you know, because height restrictions have changed and um, density has changed and um, and mm -hmm. architectural styles have changed. So, you know, there's this question around like traditional um, compatibility versus finding, finding certain elements that maintain a cohesiveness of language around the um, all these different components. And so just from an architectural standpoint, I think it's an important piece to address if we can find a way to do it non-controversially, <laughs> like try to make something as universally standard as possible. So that's my two cents. Anybody else want to weigh in on that? There is an approach to this, which is keep it interpretable rather than lock it into a definition so that we have some, so that the board, or I'm thinking of future boards, has some flexibility. And, you know, the the board decides by majority votes, there could be dissension, right? People don't have to agree in lockstep, but there's a there's a majority opinion that moves forward and on the other hand right i i take your point um that by providing some definition we could say that we really want to pursue a certain aesthetic or I, yeah i guess um i agree with you and i think this is maybe just um, I think that, you know, having some interpretive aspect to it is, is key, um, mm -hmm. so that it's not so strictly defined. However, it would be a shame to have like a, a new group of panelists, let's say, come in and determine that compatible means maintaining the exact same as the context surrounding. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I think or you know something completely different um and so i feel like there may be a, just a, a it would be nice to maybe include just a brief description of how we as you know members of the design review board design professionals interpret that language mm -hmm. and that it could give a bit of a framework for defining what we how we gauge compatibility um, and, and not as a golden standard or like a rigid definition, but just as a kind of a guideline of sorts 
to give people kind of like a, a framework for thinking about what compatibility means from a from an architectural standpoint. Sure. What do other people think? I think I think that is really key, and I think it's going to be extremely challenging. Yeah. Do you do you have something specific in mind when you're thinking about how to sort of um, define compatibility, how to present it? Um, I could I could I could take a pass at trying to summarize my thoughts. I mean, yes, I think that there are ways to define it, um, perhaps by example of, for example, um, you know, window like fenestration patterns. So like there might be a certain rhythm that you see on the street, um, like looking behind Erica's background, you know, there's like a certain kind of rhythm of windows that whether it's a, has the exact same lintel detail or it's, you know, masonry specifically that it, it, it holds that same kind of continuity of fenestration mm -hmm. across that facade. So that's an example. Um, there's like datums of the, the, the first floor level and kind of the relationship of that to the rest of the building height. And so there's like a proportional relationship that can be maintained. Um, so, you know, I mean, I could, I could list a few examples like that mm -hmm. and perhaps there's a way to define it that doesn't have to be quite so specific, but perhaps it also is helpful to have a couple examples like that. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, I, I would expect that, that the examples or the explanation would have to um, take into account various, various architectural periods. And so we have a very modern building next to some of the Victorian houses on, on North Pleasant Street. Um, how, how would we, we um, talk about compatibility? Because there will be architectural um, differences as time goes on. We see that happening as much as we try to preserve what can be preserved. Um, there, there are various um, examples of architectural periods in town. Yeah. So I think you could compare the, the periods using the example you used, Lindsay, but we should be mindful, in my opinion, I think we should be mindful of that as well. I agree. Can I share one more thing with you? Um, so this is something that we all received uh, we don't refer to it very often, but this is this booklet, this 32 page booklet is the context in which um, our design review board standards live. And let me zoom out for a second. If you can see that in here, there are many illustrated examples of what these things mean. Um, these were developed in 2008, I think, by the date on the document. But you could all, maybe Jacinta would be willing to reshare this whole document with us by email. You could take a look. Um, heights, proportions are, you know, those individual terms are defined in here. So maybe there's something in here, we don't refer to this very often, um, that would be helpful. I just wanted to make sure that we're all aware that this document exists. That's great. Yeah. And I just want to add that, you know, part of this too is the is the master planning of the town and thinking yeah. ahead, not just, you know, what's here, but what's going to be compatible with the vision moving forward. Um, and knowing that there will be a certain increase in density downtown um and that there's a a need for you know higher higher buildings um and also that some of the buildings are you know they're they're you know the gems of Amherst they're they're legendary in their in their place and time um and others 
really aren't, you know, but they set that they kind of are consistent with that, that shorter um, height, smaller scale that, um, that makes the town quaint and like has a certain kind of like character to it that we want to preserve, but at the same time may not have the same kind of historical value. Um, so I'm thinking about like the north end of North Pleasant Street, um, where, you know, there's a lot of development happening. If then you have the bank and the spoke and the like Garcia's or whatever. And so it's like there's this kind of like hodgepodge along there that we're all used to seeing this kind of like, you know, smaller scale building. Um, but at the same time, like those buildings that are the smaller scale, at least on that side of the street, really don't have any kind of historical value per se, like like the ones on the south side do. Mm -hmm. um, north side, am I switching north and south? <laughs> the ones behind you are on the north side of town, right? Okay, I'm just getting confused. Uh, yeah. yeah. Anyway, yeah. my point is that um, I think it's important to think about what's what's planned for the town in terms of scale and density, and and to try to create some guidelines with that with that forward thinking in mind, and not just thinking kind of based on what it has been. Um, so. Yeah, like other people have said, I really appreciate that. And I want to also say I appreciate that you're volunteering to take a pass at it. I think that that is um, great and hard. It's um, it, it's trying to capture a lot in some kind of concise statement. And I think it will be a challenge, but I'm glad that you're willing to take that on. Yeah. It would be wonderful to have the handbook. I must say I didn't receive a copy, so oh. um, if there's a way to distribute that, that would be great. Yeah, and I, I would as well, Erica. I did not receive a copy. Really? Yeah. I don't think I have one either. Oh. Well, there we go. Now I you will. Least too, so I can <laughs> pass them along. Now you will. Um, yeah, it's... It's it's very interesting. Somebody had a fun doing some drawings. I don't know who it was. Um, okay, so I don't want to rush this to a close. If you want me to reshare the document, um, I certainly can. I just remember in the last time we met, people appreciated being able to do a more careful read on their own, you know, to print it out and and mark it up and do it on your own terms and. We don't have to wrestle with it in public, but I'd like us to be prepared to continue the conversation at the next meeting. So um, I will send this comprehensive right. document and the proposal to Jacinta to, to share with you all so that we can read it, if that sounds uh, amenable. Yes, yeah. thank you. That, that and the handbook. Right. Yes, and the handbook. And I, I'm going to mull over shall versus should. <laughs> well, I know that in taking some of my law classes, they always say you should put shall into your findings or your wording just so that it is the strongest option. Mm -hmm. um, but again, that we'll leave that up to you all to decide if that's how you want to go. Thank you. All right, then. Any other business? No. Okay. Grand. Um, and that, oh, did anybody have just a side note or side question? Did anybody have the opportunity to attend any of Dodson and Flinker's uh, downtime design standards tours yeah. or conversations? No. no. I went on the tour. I did. Yeah. Go. Yes. I couldn't go to the meetings, but I went on the tour. It was really uh, great. There were a lot of people. There were some landscape architects with amazing ideas. And I think it was, we all felt like we were with a, it was Christmas and this was our wish list. And we had all this, this, this traffic should be slowed down here. We need bigger setbacks. You know, there were a lot of ideas that came. Um, it's, it's, great to have that opportunity and they were willing to listen to it all and I hope they're going to bring it together and then we'll see what happens so yeah that's great 
thank you for sharing that. I'm, I was I was sad to miss them, but it's nice to know that there were a lot of people in attendance. All right, wonderful. Well, a motion to adjourn then. I move. I make a motion. Yeah, sorry. No, wait, no, Karen, you you were first. I'll second you. Great. I move that we adjourn. It's Thank easy. you all. I, I second. Appreciate it. Have a lovely evening. Thank Have you, you as well. Bye.